going. Here we go. All right. Well, hey, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I'm really delighted to have uh, Dwyer Murphy with us this evening uh, to talk about his brand new book, An Honest Living. And this is the advanced reading copy of it. Um, we're going to be getting a bunch of signed copies shortly. So I can, I'll try to put a link in the comments field, but I'm flying solo. So if you'd like to order one, give me a call. It's just, uh, you know, you got the number and the, my email is Patrick at Poison Pen. Feel free to give me a, an email and we will hook you up. But um, Dwyer, it's a delight to have you with, with us tonight. Oh, the pleasure is mine. This is great. I, I feel like this is a very appropriate setting to discuss some noir and I've been looking forward to, to talking with you because I know that you're, you know, you're a buff on this stuff. It's always a, a it's a pleasure to, to get to chat about it. Yeah. Let me just give you the, uh, the old formal intro that you deserve. I like the, uh, the write up on the back of the book. Um, it's Dwyer, right? I should have established that before we started. It is. Yep. That's right. You <laughs> got it. Nailed it. <laughs> I have blown that live a couple of times with people's names. Oh man. I've always kept a collection for Dwyer is an easy name to mistake. Uh, and a lot of people in the world, in the book world in New York over the years have called me Dwight. And so if you've ever made that mistake, if you're out there, I am keeping a very careful list. And one day, I don't know what the revenge will be, probably very modest and petty, but I'll, I'll have it on everybody who ever called well, you, Dwight. You get your revenge in the book here. Exactly. Yeah. I'll write yeah. them all into the future murder mystery. So, and know. we're going to talk about this because there's, so there's so much going on in this book and a lot of fun uh, literary play. And uh, anyway, we'll get into that. Uh, Dwyer Murphy is a New York-based writer and editor. He's the editor-in-chief of Crime Reads, uh, Lit Hub's crime fiction vertical. Vertical, hmm. uh, and the wor world's most popular destination for thriller readers. He practiced law at, is it Debevoise? Debevoise, yeah. And Plimpton in New York City, where he was a litigator and served as an editor of the Columbia Law Review. He was previously an emerging writer fellow at the Center for Fiction. His writing has appeared in The Common, Rolling Stone, Guernica, or Guernica, is that right? Uh, the Paris Review, uh, Electric Literature, and other publications. Very cool. Um, and as I said, this is your first published novel, correct? Correct. You got it. Yeah. You make, yeah. You make it sound like I've got, you've got, I've got manifestos in the drawer, but no, yes. yeah, this, yeah, this is my first. Well, have you done, uh, have you published short fiction and other things or? Yeah, some short stories. I guess for a long time, I was kind of trying to write a very different kind of fiction. And I, I don't know why I built up this conception of myself for years that I was going to write some sort of mid-century tome. Uh, I don't know. I had like Updike and Cheever as my sort of heroes for a long time and struggled for a while to write these really ponderous novels that had no need to be out in the world. And then somewhere along the way, rediscovered my love of crime fiction. And that's what really inspired this novel and kind of saved me in a lot of ways. Well, it's, um, you know, other people have mentioned it is, uh, you know, seems like a love letter to New York. It's very, very much about, um, you know, the mysterious uh, um, kind of old. New York is such a fascinating place. And the, and the way you depict it in the book, I really love it. There's a timeless quality to New York. Um, and this book has a very, uh, although it's set in 2005, and I'll ask you why, um, it also has a very old school vibe to it, you know, from the point of view, you know, um, talk a little bit about, about a, why, why you chose to set it in 2005 and, um, how you came up with this, uh, this really interesting first person narrator. The voice is so great. Well, they're connected in a lot of ways, those two questions. So why 2005, the basic, uh, conception of this novel was that I wanted to write a detective novel where there is on one level a story happening where uh, a private eye is looking for a missing person, but that there would be this other kind of story playing under the surface where what he's really looking for is a, a vanished city or a city that's in the midst of disappearing. And from my, my money, that would version of New York, kind of think of it as like the end of the analog era was right around 2005, 2006, when 
yes, there was the internet, but it hadn't quite permeated our lives in such a, a way as it has now. There wasn't any social media. People didn't really carry smartphones with them. And so when you were out in the city, you really were existing in this public place. And so I wanted there to be this detective who kind of, in addition to solving a very real mystery and a missing person, he would also have uh, this need to just go walk around the city and discover various mysteries and lives that were carrying on around him at the time. So uh, I was a former lawyer in New York. And so if we want to get into why this is kind of a first person detective novel, the real reason is just because I love first person detective novels. I love crime fiction that has that strong voice and that tradition of, you know, bringing you right into a perspective and my my feeling that is that it's a little easier or maybe just for me it's more direct to create the very specific particular atmosphere of a pi hard-boiled noir story if you have that first person and you can draw the reader right in and so i naturally was attracted to the first person but it was really just an excuse for my det detective who you know this is 2005, 2006, New York. There are private eyes operating in the city at that point, but that wasn't necessarily a world I was equipped to or interested in depicting. So this is a character who's a washed out corporate lawyer who's an accidental PI, an accidental private eye, and becomes kind of a, a solver of mysteries uh, almost by chance. And um, we'll, we can get into the, you know, where uh, Dwyer Murphy, the... Uh, the uh... <laughs> the real human and uh, our protagonist, there's a lot of overlap there um, and a lot of fun. I think if I'm reading it correctly, there's some, there's some fun that you're having with uh, identity throughout the book, you know, in various different forms and different ways. Uh, yeah, and, basically again, I don't want to, I don't want to give away spoilers because, you know, because um, there are some real fun uh, and, and very clever tricks uh, in this book that I don't want to reveal. But um, what can you say about, about that? The fictional character? Oh, I, yeah, I basically gave him a version of my name. I mean, we started at the top with you asking <laughs> to pronounce my name and whether right. we got it right. But there is a scene that's depicted in this novel that's more or less drawn from life where the character is at a kind of an extravagant dinner of the kind that in 2005, if you worked at a law firm, you would be treated to after you had won a case. And in this instance, he has uh, been working for a credit card company who wanted to own the color black and they, they've done it. He's pulled it off. Uh, and so they take them all out to an extravagant dinner at a restaurant and he's given a parting gift, the, the, a wooden baseball bat color, the color black, the color that he's just won for them. And, uh, you know, it says, uh, thinks you knocked it out of the park or some inane comment like that. And it's got his name engraved on the bat, only they've spelled his name wrong. And he's, uh, that's the last straw. And he just, he can't work in this world anymore. He decides that he's going to quit. So he goes off on his own and decides he's going to work neighborhood cases and kind of ends, make ends meet however he can. And that's the beginning of his sort of journey into becoming a private eye. And that, that's more or less a version of my own <laughs> departure from the, from corporate law practice in New York. And so I, I have an, uh, I would say kind of a complicated uh, relationship to my former practice as a lawyer in, on the one hand, it kind of shaped me and was an important formative experience for me being a litigator in New York in those years. And it kind of wires your brain to work in a certain way that I don't know that you can ever cure yourself of. And yet I also have kind of a, an intense distaste or disenchantment with the profession. So a lot of that was poured into this book, hopefully in a fun way. I was mostly just kind of, you know, having a little affectionate mockery of the profession, but yeah. Right. I wanted to, um, and again, this this is in, in some ways a bibli biblio mystery as well. Right. Uh, it, it, it is steeped in the world of books in all different sorts of ways. And um, if I'm not mistaken, the book opens in, what is it, the po Pokeline? How do you say that? The Pokelin Society? Yeah, I guess I would pronounce it as Pokelin, but I, okay. I just made it up. That's, uh, you know, it was one of Moliere's fa uh, family names and uh, he was kind of a famous book lover. But this is sort of an amalgamation of various private libraries that existed in New York City. Uh, some of them continue to exist. 
This one is on 47th Street, which uh, it was the location of the old Center for Fiction, which is where I was writing during my days and a building that I have tremendous affection for on 47th Street. So just to, to kind of uh, give you some of the context, New York City for a long time was really full of private libraries and they were formed by either various scholarly societies or uh, the particular one that I'm writing about here, the old mercantile library was formed by a lot of clerks who were working in Midtown and wanted somewhere to go to read and kind of edify themselves during their lunch breaks and after work. But there were a lot of also libraries that were just associated with different different society clubs and scholarly societies. And they existed all over New York and some of them lasted to today. And they're really these incredible archives and sanctuaries throughout the city. They, you know, you'll be walking down uh, through the Diamond District on 47th Street, which is still one of the most bustling, uncanny streets in all of New York City, just uh, really vivid and wild. And then you're kind of surrounded by skyscrapers. And in the middle of this is just this beautiful old eight story townhouse essentially that is completely packed to the gills with books and is full of people who love books uh and i was lucky enough to get to work there for a while and have a lot of friends who were there as well and it was just this really beautiful place but i i opened the the novel with a, a scene of kind of book lovers at the center for fiction and really that's just or not a fictionalized version of that building and that's just because i love that version of New York, uh, it was one of the reasons I moved to the city is you can find these communities of aficionados and obsessives and people who just love a thing, whether that thing is, you know, going to the movies to see a Hitchcock repertory, or it's to go somewhere to read old books and talk with other people who love rare books. Like there are these places in the, in the city. And I, I, I just kind of wanted to explore. I love, you know, that private eye tradition of the, the detective can take you into these worlds that you really right. wouldn't have entry into in any other form. And Absolutely. it's, it's thrilling when you get to see that. I love the, uh, the homage to, and I brought one of my, my little treasures here, the homage to yeah. uh, the opening line of, uh, of this book. It was, yeah, that was, that was what got my imagination fired. I needed to have, you know, instead of Terry Lennox, it was going to be my character, yeah. but somebody standing outside of a building, just a little bit tipsy, mouthing off. That's a, that's a nice way to reveal a character. So that's the, that's the opening line of the book is a nice homage to that Chandler. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, there's something we were talking before we got started here live. And I, as I said, I haven't been to uh, Gotham City uh, since pre, pre 9-11, so quite a while now. And um when I was there, I went to, uh, you know, of course I had to go down to the Algonquin and, and see that. And, and, uh, but I went to a reading, a poetry reading from the Irish poet, Paul Muldoon. Who oh was yeah. Reading, who was reading it. One of the, it wasn't a library like this, but it had that kind of very effete sort of vibe to it. A lot of tweed. Yeah. And, right. uh, and I love that about New York, you know, as you say, there are these, uh, there's something uh, very comforting about this unapologetically intellectual uh, culture, you know, and that has to be, has to be saved, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And like how many places, how many places I guess are you gonna find still where like we, we formed big parts of this story, my editor and I making sure that the characters could attend certain screenings of like the French repertory that showed in 2006 at the film forum that it felt like everybody you met in New York was going to see Army of Shadows, the Melville movie. And it really, it felt like that for about a month. And it just, you know, obviously the whole city isn't actually stopping to go see a Melville movie, but the fact that it can feel like that for kind of one glimmering moment is part of the magic of being in this city. Yeah. And if you want to find it, you can find it. Exactly. Uh, you know, and you want to go see some great jazz, you know, any, any night. Um, it's funny, Les Paul was still playing. Yeah. At, uh, Fat, was it Fat Tuesdays? I can't remember where it was, but when I went there, uh, yeah, amazing. Um, let's just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, about, about the actual pl plot. You know, what, what is the case? He is approached by uh, someone who's calling herself anoretic, um, in, in the beginning of the book. Can you sort of outline yeah, so the basic story? I mean, a lot of that plot, uh, so I guess with, 
to, to set it up, it, it, he's a lawyer who's kind of making ends meet working neighborhood cases. And a, a woman comes to him and says that uh, she's getting divorced from her husband, an old bookseller, and that she thinks he's stealing true crime volumes that she's inherited from her family. And she wants our, our lawyer to, to go take a look and see if he can, uh, if he can kind of perform a, like what's called a controlled buy to sort of catch him in the act and then give it to her divorce attorneys. It turns out that uh, the case is much more complicated than that. He has quite a nice time, our detective going and talking books and uh, sort of manipulating this old bookseller at his uh, society on 47th street. But uh, to just sort of, you know, put it in the context that most people who are going to be interested in this will know the structure of the novel largely for the first few chapters follows the structure of the film Chinatown and our characters slowly begin to suspect that they are in, they are being manipulated by somebody who is following the plot of Chinatown uh, to manipulate them. And it's kind of uh, a meditation on the way the fiction that we love so intensely, whether it's a book or a movie kind of bleeds into our, our real life. Yeah, and then there's, I mean, there's so many wonderful uh, uh, kind of minor characters, but in a way, you know, I, uh, U- Ulysses or Ulysses, yeah. uh, Lima. Yeah. Um, I love how, he, I love the scenes that he's in, which you use them sparingly, but um, uh, there's a good line. He, uh, Ulysses had a, a good sharp mind that was always misremembering things. I love that line. <laughs> he's a Venezuelan poet. Yeah, I, I, so he's a, the idea is, I mean, one, I just love crime fiction has such a great tradition of secondary and tertiary characters that are, you know, bring a real shot of life and wildness and madness into the story. And I think that uh, when you're in New York in your 20s and in a lot of cities, it's not just New York, a lot of places in your 20s, you've often got some of those wild figures in your life who can show up on a given evening and really change the course of uh, of your life potentially. And so our our character here, a narrator, has his best friend as a, a Venezuelan poet who's always bringing him strange cases from the art world to, to get involved in. And this character, you know, he's a... a my wife is a Venezuelan lawyer and uh, uh, she, she brings a lot of passion and strangeness into my life. So I think I, I poured some of her into that character probably. <laughs> and um, there was a, let's see here. There was a key, uh, key passage, at least to me, as I read the book here. Um, if you're following along at home, it's on page, seven, no, page 79. Um, it says, any man can hang a painting in his dining room, he said. Uh, he can show it to his friends, tell them how much he paid for it, how much he can sell the thing for in Geneva or London. They, they look at his painting and agree it's interesting. Uh, with a book, your pleasures are private. Uh, private pleasures are not much in vogue these days. Uh, what's the point of being privately rich? You know, I thought that really encapsulated so much about the, about the uh, antiquarian book world. Does, yeah, the rare book world is so you know, particular and kind of lovely in that way, because it isn't the same as owning a painting that you can put on your wall and then have your friends come over and it's this immediate status or wealth symbol. I think you have to earn it a little bit more with a rare book. And I'm sure that, you know, uh, as we're speaking, there is, there are people out there who are figuring out how to, uh, break down rare books and build hedge funds around them the way they've done with art and to, you know, use them as uh, strange security vehicles, but it's really hard to do. And it's hard to imagine there ever being the particular uh, bubble, the way that they're, I'll call it a bubble in the, the art world where the price of a painting has almost no connection to reality that one can discern. Whereas I think with the rare, with rare books, there's something a little bit more dignified about it. And yeah, there are people who just collect to collect and you can go to the Sotheby's book auction and find some books that have uh, abstract to the point of absurdity prices attached to them. But by and large, it is still this subculture of people who care passionately about these things and 
have poured a lot of themselves into these objects and gotten a tremendous amount from them too. So I just, I love the rare book world and I spent as much time as I can in New York puttering around to rare books or talking with people who deal in them or collect strange things. And it's great for the, in this, this particular world that I'm talking about here, a lot of the collectors are dealing in these old trial pamphlets, which if anybody's ever come across them, they're these very, they were very cheaply made 19th century, widely distributed publications that chronicled uh, grisly murders, confessions, executions that were going on in time. They were tremendously popular and some of them have survived to this day. And you can go to the New York Historical Society up in Central Park West to the beautiful old building and ask one of the librarians to bring you a box of these things. And they're so flimsy, they're almost, they feel like they're going to fall apart in your fingers and you can read about blood and gore in the 19th century and get a real idea for what America was. And it, it feels yeah. like holding on to history. So you can imagine how people would become passionate about things like that. Absolutely. And they have, they have these great kind of lurid titles, you know, being <laughs> the account of a, of the beheading that occurred on, you know, things like that. Yeah. People were competing, you know, wildly to try to get these pamphlets out and to sell them. And if you could, you know, sneak into the jail and bribe a jailer and get a confession uh, of somebody right before they were executed, you knew you were going to be a bestseller. You know, it was like, that's right, how you, right. Right. it was the penny dreadful kind of exactly. yeah. era. Uh, um, are there any things that you collect? I'm not a collector at all. I like to get rid of as much as I possibly can. I'm just inexorably drawn to people who are collectors, though. A lot of, I did sort of a lot of literary journalism over the years, uh, and a lot of what I ended up writing about were these people who had developed uh, really interesting collections or were practicing old versions of the book trade. And I, I've always just, I've always loved that passion that people bring to it sometimes bordering on you know uh mania and those are the people I'm, i've always been interested in especially it's like the, the more specific and arcane the interest you know the absolutely yeah. sometimes the more fascinating the you know the person yeah but i think i grew up in uh, my father ran a bookstore and i think that and i worked in it from a, a young age and i think that maybe that warned me off of having too many books of my own or collecting them as fetish objects you know you get used to a certain work a day attitude towards books when you grow up in a bookstore which which bookstore was it it was a university bookstore in massachusetts and so it had this real you know a real hustle to it and i i worked for a long time on the the loading docks just sort of hustling books in and out on hand trucks and i think that that was kind of those were my most formative memories of being a teenager and younger than that doing the handling books in that way. So I I've never personally been likely, I guess, to sort of treat books that way. And yet I found myself often whenever I had spare time, I would go down to the auction houses in New York and get the, the very kind, generous informed experts there to take me around and show me these kind of priceless objects. I've always just been interested in them that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I you know, th- I, I've got some, not too many things like this, but the, yeah. usually what I, what I like to kind of collect uh, is the old vintage paperbacks yep. you know, um, simply because they don't take up as much room. And, and the covers are great, right? The covers yeah. are so great. Uh, yeah. yeah. I should start putting like a cover a day on online or something. I've but, got a lot of, I do have one thing that I'll collect, I guess a little bit is that I've had the good luck to go to spend a lot of time in Paris over the years. And whenever I've been there uh, or now, if my wife is there without me, we get a lot of uh, paperbacks of classic crime fiction, whatever we can find there. And I've got, I've got some really nice things. I'm not in my, my home right now, but if I were, I would have in back in me a lot of cool old French paperbacks of Chandler and uh, Ron Ronald, you know, yeah. Some of the second noir, uh, and also today, I mean, a lot of people out there will know this, but like the modern stuff, Gallmeister uh, editions in France do these incredible covers for sort of classic noir and contemporary American outdoor writing, but they're just beautiful. And so I've, I've got the the collection of old, like Sergei Noir, Chandler novels and back of me on the shelf. And then 
the new additions of Ross McDonald that Gallmeister has put out. And, you know, they're, they're French, which, so it's not like I'm like sitting down to read my Ross McDonald's in French or anything, but I love them. So I guess I do have a little bit of that collector book. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting how, how, uh, you know, people in some ways, especially the, the real rare and weird stuff, they're preserving kind of a forgotten culture in some ways, you know, people that collect the old pulp magazines, for instance. And Yeah. Well, my day job is uh, I, I work at Crime Reads, which we kind of, we cover the, the culture of crime fiction and mystery and noir. And we've got some great writers who write for us who are, you know, just really passionate and learned on the subject. Like Jay Kingston Pierce writes this great series of just like collecting old pulp and covers and keeping that it really is a culture the art that went into some of those you know yeah. to our eye today part of it is the, the luridness but the art was I think undeniably sort of beautiful and uh, it's, it's cool that there are people out there who are making sure that that you know that exists still and that we're aware of who those artists were yeah Robert McGinnis you know exactly. paperback stuff and yeah you know I, I run a a discussion group that here at the bookstore that's devoted to hard-boiled and noir fiction. And um, we've been doing it for like 21 years, I think. And uh, it's it's a lot of fun, you know? And we, a lot of that old, even if the books are like second, third, fourth tier, um, they're, they're always interesting time capsules of the era, you know? And so we can get into an interesting discussion just on that subject. Yeah, I mean, I think hard-boiled, it's funny because it's not especially in vogue, I guess, these days. And yet there is this really timeless quality to it. And so many people who I think are writing today and are popular are sort of tapping into a lot of those attitudes still and bringing some of that. To me, the thing that distinguishes Hard Boiled is just the, the care with which style was applied to story. And for me, atmosphere, style, the tonal quality that some of those novels maintain is everything and that's what i that's what i read those books for and that's why i love them so much let's talk a little bit about uh, let's get back to the uh, uh the reddick uh anna reddick and and newton reddick and um i'm interested in in anna um you know who also uh this this isn't a spoiler because it's we find out very early in the book um she also is a novelist who writes under a pseudonym um <laughs> a.m burn um and let me see if I get this right. She won the National Book Award when she was kind of a wunderkind of 24 years old, right. um, written a couple more books. But she comes from this old school New York family. Uh, tell me a little bit about her and where she, you know, where she came from. Well, I think probably a lot of uh, that character was uh, me uh, putting some of my own kind of disenchantments with literary life in New York into another character who is maybe more successful than uh, than I and better able to to sort of scorn something. But uh, I'm really just sort of, I think, mocking it because I love literary life in New York. I moved there for it and I got to participate in it for a long time and I feel very lucky, but I also want to sort of poke fun at myself and a lot of other people who are involved in it. So I use this character who is kind of a, sex, a successful literary novelist who uh, has become disenchanted with literature, literary life in New York, and keeps telling everybody that she's going to write a crime novel because that seems more satisfying to her, but never, never quite does it and instead gets herself mixed up in a mystery with this lawyer. And they kind of go off together and sort of act as uh, act as detective while our, our lawyer is sort of solving a mystery. She's sitting there quietly taking notes for this presumed crime novel she's going to write one day. Let's see here. We just got a, yeah, we just got a, a comment that just came in. Um, who this gentleman says, I also have formative memories of working at a college bookstore and slinging boxes on the loading dock, wouldn't trade them for anything. <laughs> Amen. It was, it was something really satisfying. I think yeah, I, I'm, I'm really making an effort here not to swear constantly. I think in my everyday life, I have sort of a, a real Boston attitude where I'm just cursing all the time and I have a, a particular vigorous, uh, <laughs> vigorous, attitude towards speech and I picked up most of that on the loading dock I would say I just I 
all of, from age, I don't know, 12 to 20, I was working uh, on that loading dock with a lot of Teamsters and career book uh, people. And it was, it was a really nice culture to get to grow up in. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about, about some of the influences that went into the book. Uh, um, tell me about, I mean, it's such an interesting mix of lots of different things. I mean, I do see obviously the, the nods to classic noir. And I love what, um, uh, is it Taya Obrett? Is that yeah. her name? I love what she said here. She says, uh, uh, an electrically good time meted out in fine, sharp, crackling prose that somehow manages to be an homage, a send up and reinvention all at once. What a wonderful quote. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but the, yeah, there is elements of that, but there are lots of other literary things going on here, you know, different non-crime uh, elements in here. Who are some of your yeah, other I, influences? Well, it's funny, I a lot. It doesn't seem like you should be able to write a crime novel built out of your obsession for Edith Wharton fiction, but a lot of this, a lot of this was built out of. I, I've always read Edith Wharton obsessively and continue to this day to do so, and will at any opportunity pick up uh, a copy of House of Mirth or Age of Innocence or any of these. But I think that's just partly stemmed from my my interest in New York as a city and the history of the, the civilization that was built here. And for me, you know, there's nobody who captured it more perfectly and elegantly than Edith Wharton. So uh, in fact, the first section of the book is kind of named after an Edith Wharton uh, book and the characters kind of keep running into her along the way. Uh, and then- Conrad uh, appears a lot too. <laughs> I know. I love Conrad. He's another one of my weaknesses and weaknesses is just, you know, obsessions. I, I love Conrad and will also read Lord Jim or Nostromo uh, at any moment. I'm, you know, liable to be carrying around a paperback copy of one of those for no particular reason. And I also just kind of wanted uh, these characters to walk into one another's homes and immediately look at their bookshelves because that's how I like go snooping. I'm looking at your bookshelf right now, Patrick, and back you and trying to, you know, figure out who you are. This is my my little mystery to solve. But I'm sure other people who are out there do that same thing, right? You go over Absolutely. to somebody's house for a dinner party and you got to go snooping around their bookshelves. So a lot of these books and authors get mentioned, uh, you know, partly just because they're maybe people I love, but also because I wanted to kind of you know, expose something about these characters by what books are on their shelves and to make sure that the other characters are constantly interested in that fact the way I would be. And, you know, as you say, New York, uh, New York is a city made up of books and from books. And it's just, uh, at least that's the way, that's the way I kind of take it. Um, it's still, yeah, I mean, this is set in that era when there still were just used bookshops all over the city and, you know, rare book dealers still operate. And the, like, to some extent, you know, it still exists. And like, there are these great independent shops all over the place in the city and they're doing as well as ever. And, you know, the antiquarian fairs happen every year and they're great. And so the uh, people, people love books here still. And it's, it's invigorating to see, you know, I'm the same way that you guys have your bookstore and you're keeping this, community alive it, it's you know books really bring us together in that way absolutely um what uh how did you get i wanted to ask how did you get the crime reads gig well actually so this very much blends into the action of the story i guess so i was uh i had a writing fellowship from the center for fiction it's this really generous institution besides being a private library they also give fellowships out to young writers in new york who are trying to make a go of it they give them some writing space they introduce them to the the book world here in new york and it's just a, a tremendous institution i'm gonna be there tomorrow they've moved out to brooklyn i can't wait to be there but so i was writing days in the center for fiction and i uh, was also doing some kind of journalism for lit hub at that time uh, and I became kind of disaffected with what I was writing I just started wandering the amazing crime fiction collection that the center for fiction has the very first book I kind of picked up that reminded me how much I love crime fiction because I think I'd forgotten for about a decade was Walter Mosley's devil in a blue dress and I just mm. sat there for the next eight hours I couldn't move from this chair that I had found in this nice corner of this townhouse on 47th street and I just read Devil in a Blue Dress cover to cover and realized 
I'm going to give myself an education in crime fiction while I'm here. So while I was also kind of trying to write and do some other literary projects, I, I started educating myself in crime fiction. And at that, by that time, I had been hired to be a sports editor for Lit Hub because we were going to launch this new version of the website where like the old, you know, like George Plimpton Sports Illustrated days, we were going to have these 5,000 word pieces where we sent novelists to try out for minor league baseball teams and do these odd projects that, you know, of course, were completely impractical and just a, a beautiful dream that never came to fruition. And at that time, we realized one thing we could do is create a magazine for crime lovers. And I happened to be the crime lover on staff at that time and jumped at the chance to do it. So now, years later, I have the great pleasure, along with a couple of colleagues, Molly Odens and Olivia Rutigliano, that we get to read crime fiction all day and spark conversations and, uh, you know, get to write about it and think about it all day long. It's a real, it's a joy. I'll have to pitch something to you. Have you guys ever published anything? Uh, maybe this is a better conversation for us. <laughs> no, tell me. I want to hear it now. Have you ever published anything on Patrick Hamilton? I don't think so. There we go. He wrote, uh, well, he wrote Hangover Square, you know, famous. Yeah, yeah, no. And um, I'm fascinated by him. And also right now, you know, people are using that term um, gaslighting. Right. Um, of, course. of course, it comes from him. You know, he, yeah. that's his, his term. All right. I'm making a note. I've got a notebook over here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a note of it. This is great. So some of those. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it, it might be fun to do like a little retrospective on Hamilton. Uh, you know, the, the great thing about it is so Crime Reads ended up becoming honestly way more popular than any of us imagined i mean at this point we reach millions every month and it's it's wild and i think that the secret to it which is no secret to most people who do this for a living already was that if you are passionate about some very specific thing you can write a cool piece for the internet and find thousands of other people who are also really fascinated by that same thing you know and like i think the moment it hit me was Years ago, I wrote this piece about, you know, the movie Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, the adaptation of Le Carre, not the TV series, but rather the movie with Gary Oldman. Right. I was obsessed with the Christmas party of the Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy world. There's a, you know, maybe a, a scene that amounts to three minutes or something like that. But I just, I loved this and wrote kind of a, a long meandering discourse on the Christmas party scene in that. And you wouldn't believe how many people I get mail every single week from people who still want to talk about the Christmas party scene at Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. And it's just, it's great. That's what the internet is for. I mean, I think the world that we're talking about in New York here and in some other cities where you got to get together and find like-minded obsessives now exists on the internet and is much faster and more accessible for that reason. Yeah. But there's still a part of me that has a lot of nostalgia for the days when I spent all of my time hanging outside of movie theaters, looking for people to go down to the diner with me to talk about that, you know, French crime film that we just saw. Yeah. 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 And are you, um, are you into, I'm sure you are some of the old, old school journalists of, you know, from New York, you know, like, um, Joseph Mitchell, of course. And uh, yeah, of course up in the old hotel has got to be, I'm, I'm shocked that I probably office. didn't put it in this, book here but just as you're saying that i'm thinking how did, how the hell did i not have this in the in the book because i i love that stuff those little yeah. vignette slices of life in new york are just they were you know really impactful for me and i love them so intensely was liebling new york yeah yeah the yeah of course and is it was right up my alley when i was you know thinking i was going to be the literary sports editor of a magazine yeah right 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 Perfect. i love stuff in the boxing and he had that, um, he had that great, there was a, a short-lived library of larceny that put out <laughs> these, these very specific books. One of them was, um, and sorry, folks, we're just nerding out off topic here, but there was a book called Magurti, uh, Memoirs of a, of a Billiard, kind of bum hustler. Great book. Uh, I love that. That kind of stuff is just great, isn't it? Come on. Who does the, Lieb the Liebling one was the telephone booth Indian. You know, and it was all about right. the history of this particular public telephone in this building and all the underworld traffic that, ah, it's just a great piece. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, 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 that's what uh, crime writing is good at, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, is it gives you 
entry into this world that you wouldn't get to experience otherwise, right? Like that, that telephone booth that can tell the, the history of a particular section of the underworld of New York City. Like crime novels give you entree. Like that's what your detective is for. He, he manages to walk the mean streets, but also open up some doors and walk in play. I, I always love the beginning of like the Lou Archer novels where he almost always is getting summoned to either a lawyer's office or a beach club in, you know, Santa Teresa. And it's just it's this, it, this world of opulence and corruption opens up immediately in front of you. And there's something so exciting when your, your detective first takes those, those steps and you, you get a sense like, okay, this is going to be an interesting world that I've never visited before. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the uh, the title an honest living was that yours or was that a something that a collaboration yeah, so, with your culture? <laughs> no, we struggled for quite a while to find the right title for it, and I think for a long time we just had a TBD sort of to be determined title on this thing. And the publisher, uh, I have I'm fortunate to have a great editor at Viking, Ibrahim Ahmad, and I think it was his suggestion that we were at the end of our rope for a title and he thought that uh, that I would operate well if I had exactly one bottle of red wine in me and that I should drink one bottle of red wine and watch Chinatown again. I hadn't watched it in a long time because it was so such an influence on this book that I found I couldn't go anywhere near the movie when I was actually writing this book because it would just be, it would, it would uh, maybe be a little bit too, too direct. Uh, and so I wanted to create this separation between myself and the movie. Uh, and he told me, okay, drink a bottle of red wine and watch that movie. And we're going to get a title out of it. And it's the scene when Jack Nicholson as Jake Giddies is in the barber shop and he's just kind of pulled this, uh, this job where he's caught, uh, he thinks he's caught Mal Ray having an affair and, you know, it's on the front page of the newspaper and he's kind of peacocking around in the way that Nicholson can and he's at the barbershop getting a straight razor shave. And the guy in the next seat looks at the newspaper and looks at him and gives him some sort of disgusted remark. And, you know, it turns out that guy is from the bank and he forecloses on people's houses. And he, in Nicholson, Giddy's, this, you know, opinion, he's a more disgusting person. So Giddy's kind of like snaps out of his chair and says, hey, buddy, I make an honest living. And I just, I love the way Nicholson delivers that line and the way, you know, he packs into it all of this, knowing pathos and like you know he he knows he doesn't make an honest living he, he absolutely knows he doesn't and that's the that's the kind of joke but he's going to defend himself anyway against the schmuck from the bank right right um there's so many uh you know um uh, so many nice details that you that you show us the, the, the kind of the ghosts of the of the old city underneath the new um uh outside those brown stones look like nothing could ever unsteady them. Uh, but inside you feel how old and narrow they are, built for a different time, prone to leaks and drafts. Uh, and in the winter, mice come in from the street to nibble on the warm wiring behind the old walls. Yeah, I just like those kind of details that are all over this book. Um, yeah, those brownstones in New York, they they look so beautiful. And they, it really is when you get inside. It's You know how sometimes you go to like, visit a historic home and it's, you know, I don't know who it's some 18th century personage that you go in there and everything just kind of looks small and like it's closing in on you. The walls and the beds are tiny, right? It's that, that yeah. feel history closing in on you. What's it? Yeah. I mean, we live in a 1920s house, which isn't terribly old for New York standards, but for Phoenix, it's, it's pretty right. old. And um, yeah, I mean, it has all the original tiny little closets you know, and it just yeah. reflects a different, different society. I think in the line that you just read about the mice coming in to nibble on the wires, I, I'm sure that I wrote or thought that when I was living, my wife and I lived for a decade or more in a classic uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn railroad apartment and a railroad apartment for those who don't know, means like one room after another, there are no doors in between them it's like railroad cars just they they open onto one or sometimes like in new orleans they call them shotgun homes very similar concept but just a straight line we had no doors it was a great apartment and it was cheap and it meant that we got to pursue the lives we wanted to because it was so cheap but it was very narrow no doors so when you're arguing you can't slam a door on one another you gotta like just jump out the window onto the fire escape but 
uh, I can still just remember, you know, the the sound of, in the winter when the mice would come in. And this happens all over New York, even in beautiful, expensive homes. There's no getting around it. The, the mice come in winter to sort of nibble on something warm and they want the wires in your walls and you you can just hear them and it it, it, it gets inside of your head. So that, that must have worked its way into the book. It's like the silence of the lambs. <laughs> right, exactly. The dreaming of the lambs late at night. Exactly. Oh, man. Um, did this, how did this, this novel kind of, um, how did it come to be? What was your sort of, as they say, path to publication? Was it a, did it start out of a short story or was it all conceived as a novel from the very beginning? No, it was kind of an act of desperation because like I said before, I'd been trying to write a very different kind of novel for a long time. And then when my wife uh, became pregnant with our first child, I decided that I had, I think at this time we, it was probably seven months, you know, to go in the pregnancy and that I needed to finally write a novel that I cared about and wanted to, and that this might be my last chance. Uh, I don't know why I just had decided that this had to happen before my daughter came into the world. And so in kind of a mad dash, I, I decided rather than writing the type of book I had always thought I should be writing, I was going to write the type of book I wanted to write. And I think the first week after uh, my wife, found out that we were pregnant, she she and I were staying up late and watching a lot of old movies together and having these bizarre conversations we used to have about like lawsuits that the characters might bring against one another. And all of this was weighing on me. And I think I, I went for a very long run from Williamsburg over, over the Williamsburg Bridge into Manhattan and into a coffee shop uh, where I sat down and wrote the first chapter to this novel that I think more or less exists as the first chapter uh, down to, you know, almost the, the exact words to this day. And that I just, I knew I wanted to write a, a crime novel and uh, I, I was able to, to get it done before my, my daughter joined us. So I was very fortunate to finally realize that, you know, sometimes I think you just need that. Uh, there's something on the horizon, a major life change that convince you know it gives you some clarity and I, I've talked to a lot of writers who have had a similar experience that 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 will give you some clarity sometimes interesting yeah I'm glad you mentioned the running I was going to bring that up because that figures into the book you know your character um, really gives us a tour of New York by way of his his running throughout the city very I, I yeah I love, it was probably autobiographical or it had to be yeah I love running all over the city it's still my favorite place to run and I like you know I've always liked the Flanner novel of somebody who just gets out on the boulevard and walks around and is open to the world and kind of runs into different lives and experiences and mysteries. And I've always thought it really melded well with the detective, the private eye tradition, who the private eye also needs to just get out and hit the streets. And, you know, and those are Ch the Chandler and McDonald novels, you know, you can really follow a map around LA. They're going to tell you every street they, they pounded and, it tells you something about the people who live there and you can kind of draw a map of the city that way. So I wanted to make sure that my character was out in the city always. And one of the ways that he does that is he goes on a lot of jogs and sometimes walks in. I, I always liked when I was a lawyer, I, I like to do, you, you want to sometimes have people on their back foot. And one of the ways you can do that is to, you know, you show up to a client or, another lawyer to a meeting and you're just covered in sweat and in your running gear and it, it can be really intimidating and uncanny. So anyway, I, I wanted my character to just get out there in the world. And if he's not out jogging around, he's often on the sidewalk. I used to sit outside of our apartment in Williamsburg all day long in a camping chair with a stack of books and something cold to drink next to me and just wait for, to see what would happen, you know? Yeah. 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 Now did, um, I don't recall, uh, maybe I missed it or um, that the, the 9 11, the uh, in the, is in the background very much in this book. Is it? No, we're at 2005, 2006, yeah. a little bit later than that. And I think in my mind, the major event that kind of factors in without factoring in is the economic recession, the 2008 collapse yeah. is sort of on the horizon. And because our narrator is in the world of corporate law, that is kind of, you know, he's living, in the last days of this kind of bubble wild, yeah abundance and corruption that is about to be answered for by in some you know in some fashion and so i think that in my mind that was the looming event of new york city but certainly you know the the city was still in 
recovery and grief from 2001 and that that's there too but but no it wasn't something i consciously worked into the into yeah. the novel sure um what do you what are you working on now uh so next summer there will be uh, another uh, a novel that we're we're still settling on a title but a heist novel set in coastal massachusetts in a town full of fugitives and thieves uh and that will be out next summer i think uh if uh, if the timing works out, and then hopefully the year after that, we're gonna have a sequel to an honest living where the characters, wow. uh, a couple of the characters from this novel, will dash down to Miami, and it's my my Elmore Leonard homage. We didn't talk about it yeah. at all, but I, Elmore Leonard is my is my favorite writer and the person I look to probably the most whenever I need a bit of craft or inspiration or just a good kick in the ass. I'm always looking to Elmore Leonard and reading his wow. stuff, so I needed to to send my characters down to Miami and uh, let them kind of walk those streets for a little while. Yeah. I love, love him so much. Um, did you ever get a chance to meet him? No, I didn't. I, uh, did you? you, you yeah. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. That's I'm, one of the, that's one of the few perks. It's not a, there's not a lot of money in this business, but <laughs> in my, uh, in my tenure, I've been able to meet some, you know, like Westlake and um, right. like Bain and Crumley who you, Crumley is yeah. Crumley is right. All this Crumley, like how you well. give them a little, yeah. Um, oh, just a lot of the of the of the great writers of this kind of modern era, Hillerman, and that's been that's one of the real. You know, I feel very fortunate to have met a lot of these writers. You know? I'll bet I would. I I would have so many questions I would want to ask Elmore Leonard. I I find myself often, you know, reading not just his fiction but his sort of you know his thoughts on writing as well or some great videos i was talking about one the other night that i, I love that he explains how he formed his characters and the way he did it was that he'd put a character on the page and find out whether the character could talk you know whether he had the gift of gab and if the character could talk he'd get more story and if the character couldn't talk he'd kill him and that was how the kind of the the great second and third and fourth characters of these Elmore letter novels were constructed. Everybody needs to be able to hold up their end of the conversation. And that was something I wanted to kind of work into this book. So I'm glad that you, you mentioned some of those second and third characters too, because it was important to me that I, these characters all be able to, to talk and express themselves and mix it up a little bit. Like that's uh, to me, that's how you earn your place on the page is if you can carry on an interesting conversation for the reader to, to experience for a while. Yeah. And I'm going to blow her name. Um, Jamara, is that how you say? Oh, Siomara, Siomara. Yeah. yeah, she was cool. Kind of off the page most of the time, but um, tell me a little bit about her. Yeah, she's an artist who is kind of has recently uh, wrecked the heart of our narrator and is mostly off the page, but going off to Paris to have some some artistic success of her of her own. But in a lot of ways, I wanted her to be, uh, you know, I think this book is full of true artists who are following their passions and our narrator is not one of them. He <laughs> exists on the margins of the art world and makes no pretenses to them himself. I kind of, I, I was thinking a lot about like the, the Leonardo Padura novels, the Mario Conde novels, the great Cuban crime author who, you know, he's a detective, but he's got the soul of a novelist. And every once in a while, he'll make a go of it himself. But mostly he's just sort of appreciating people who are real artists and following them around. And once in a while, if he can help them solve a mystery, he'll do it. And I always, I, I like that model for a detective, somebody who's got a bit of that. Uh, he's got a bit of that in his soul, but not enough to actually try to do it himself. And he knows where he's useful and where he's not. And he can kind of support some of these artists as, along the way. I like um, uh, uh, Paco Ignacio Taibo, uh, yeah, of course. character, uh, Hector, that was a Blasco on Shane. What a yeah, great, exactly. great series. I love those books so much. Uh, I'm, I love, I've, I've talked to a couple people recently wondering why he's not more popular in the U.S. because, I mean, he's one of the most popular yeah. crime writers in the world. But I, in the U.S., I you don't come across that many people who read him, but when you do come across somebody who reads him, that you know you've got a, a kindred spirit there. Yeah, yeah, they're passionate about him. Are there any? I'm sure there. Are, um, I'm sure there are tons, but can you think of any writers that um, that you especially champion that that aren't getting their due or that you'd like to to mention? 
Yeah, I mean, we do it every day on Crime Reads. We're trying to champion yeah. so many good authors, even just like people who've got their books out this month who don't need me. But, you know, like I was just reading Jennifer Hillier's book, which is just brilliant. She doesn't need me to be telling everybody that's brilliant. But uh, the people, the author who I probably will mention the most that is my favorite, I guess, yeah, so my favorite crime novelist who is not particularly acclaimed or read in the US necessarily is Santiago Gamboa, the Colombian author who I just think has written these kind of sprawling masterpieces. And uh, I, he's the person who I, I guess I would, I would wish to be more popular in the US or maybe he's, maybe he's perfect where he is. I don't know. He's the, you know, he's, he's doing great and he's practicing his art, but I just love him. So if I can ever come across somebody who's read like, you know, Santiago Gamboa, I know that I have met, I've met somebody who I'm going to be friends with. Is he, is he translated and published? Over yeah, here. Europa Europa puts Europa. out books in the U.S. and they're just fantastic. I think I'm trying to remember what the the last one that they put out was probably Necropolis, but there's like Return to the Dark Valley and others. That just there's a series of them, and he it builds his character as a detective. He ends up acting as a detective, but he works in consular affairs at different uh, embassies and consulates for the around the world, and tends to get involved in the Latin diaspora in various uh, hmm. crimes and traumas suffered by Colombians uh, abroad. And they're just wow. brilliant, brilliant. I have to try one. I've never read him before. I'm glad you, glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, and Padua, it, is he- you have to give me, wait, I want you to give me one now. People are here. We want to hear who is yours oh. that you champion. Was, who well, are you hand selling the hardest? Well, I like, I like the oddball ones. I, I really love this guy, David Peace. You know, oh yeah, he's great. He's work. I mean, he's he can be a difficult read, um, yeah. but he wrote that uh, you know the Red Riding. Well, the, the film. I always think of him as like a British L, like James Elroy kind yeah, of. It, it's much. that really immersive language and it, really this vivid hallucinatory world. Sometimes he's brilliant. Yeah, yeah very dense and um, yeah. but the, the, these Japanese uh, set ones, the Tokyo Year Zero. You know, did you have you happen to read that one? Yeah, uh, yeah, great. yeah, just amazing. Um, That's cool that you had it right at it. You had it. You had it at the ready too. I appreciate that that you're <laughs> ready with that. That's good. I like stuff like that. I like, um, you know, the people you think. Uh, Daniel Woodrell is a big hero. Uh, yeah, James Salas, I love. Oh, I love Salas too. That was, Salas. Those were the, the the New Orleans series was one that I think I discovered pretty early too that I brought me back to crime fiction. I love that stuff. And Daniel Woodrell is somebody that I got to interview a long time ago in profile. And he just, I, I feel like he, he mentioned something to me when we were talking that has stayed with me years and years later, just that whenever you write, there needs to be a human voice behind what you're writing. It shouldn't sound like a book or literature. It should sound, there should be a human voice there. And I think I always kind of hung on to that for my own writing too. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Um, you know, Sarah Grand, I think is a yeah. writer, you know, um, she's great. And obviously that's in my, that's up my alley. Cause those are like, you know, Biblio noir, just completely madcap, insane and beautiful novels. Totally. Yeah. But there, there are just so many, there's so many. Um, well, we're lucky uh, we get to push these books out all day. They're both of us, we've got jobs that we get to just we, we tell collect, people yeah, we these cool these crime novels. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, um, uh, there are a number of people that I like to trade these, these, oh, do you know about this guy, you know, or this, this yeah. lady, um, Joe Lansdale is always a good one to chat about obscure books because oh, cool. he's, he's into it. Um, yeah. Uh, and James Salas, you know, Salas has turned me on to so many, uh, you know, he, he knows all the interesting European stuff that you would probably know too. Yeah. I've never met or talked with Salas. So if he's out there, I, I love his stuff so much. I know he's out in your, your area of the Yeah. Country. He lives here in Phoenix. Yeah. That's cool. I, I love his stuff so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, Dwyer, it's been a real, a real treat to talk with you. Um, oh, my pleasure. Everybody watching, you gotta, you gotta get a copy of this book. Um, you'll love it. Um, great, great book that kind of takes the whole uh, the PI genre and really turns it on its ear and um, just a literate, engaging, um, fun read. Uh, and we'll be getting signed copies very shortly. 
So um, congratulations on the book. It just came out, what, a couple days ago? Or is it? Yeah, I get today's one. Yesterday came out yesterday. yesterday. And honestly, this is this is such a pleasure for me. I I know that, you know, we we get into the weeds here of just like swapping names, but it's such a it's a pleasure to get to do that for a little while. So it's it was a lot of fun to talk with you. And I hope uh, I hope we get to to push some of these authors out on people, too. This is great. Yeah. And maybe maybe next year um, uh, when the book comes out, they'll they'll send you on the road. I'm coming to Arizona come hell or high water next year. I'm going to be out there. So you guys are you'll see me. Although July is probably not the best time to come out, but it doesn't matter. I like it as hot as it'll come. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, we have, I want to go a yeah. long desert run. I've got some family out there and I'm, I've already planned some long desert runs with them early in the morning and then we'll spend the afternoon at your bookstore. Awesome. Sounds good. All right, man. Well, um, we'll be in touch and uh, thanks again and congratulations. And thanks everybody for tuning in on Facebook and YouTube and have a